about this presentation, you can tweet me, I'm Jeb Bush on Twitter. <laughs> so, Nick mentioned that I hate JavaScript, and the reason he brought that up is because I have saved the first slide that was a test slide, I have zero JavaScript in this presentation. So, get ready, are you guys excited? Today I'm going to talk about the most versatile two kilobytes of JavaScript that we have in Filament Group's arsenal, open source arsenal. But I'm not going to actually talk about the JavaScript at all. So, there you go. To set the tone, I want to talk a little bit about Bootstrap. So Bootstrap advertises itself as being the most popular HTML, CSS, and uh, JavaScript framework. And they really say right on, their whole, uh, right on the tin, it's for building responsive projects on the web. And I really kind of want to challenge the notion that you can make a responsive component library in today's presentation. What makes a component, a reusable component, responsive? To answer that question, we kind of have to think, what makes a web page responsive? And the standard definition is flexible grids, flexible media, media queries. That was in the original responsive web design article by Ethan Marcotte, I don't know, probably like five or six years ago, a long time ago. <laughs> flexible grids are all about making your components fluid, uh, fluid width. Flexible media, oops, sorry. So for example, you have a grid that's 66% and the other side is 33%. Very simple. So this is what that example might look like in Bootstrap. You have a call MD8 and a call MD4. They kind of have a 12 uh, column grid system. When you resize it, it's fluid, right? Pretty easy. Uh, flexible media, which is all about making your images, your videos, uh, also basically fluid width. So one example of uh, a plugin to do this is fitvids.js. Just allows you to make your uh, video embeds. If you have like an iframe that you have a YouTube embed or something, it makes those fluid width. Um, the last one is media queries. But in fact, media queries are based on uh, the viewport size, not parent container size. So they're very limited, and it's very hard to customize them for reusable components. And one approach to try and solve this problem is a new specification that's being drafted called container queries. It was originally called element queries, um, but the original draft, they had some problems where you'd make a uh, make a element query that would resize the element to be larger <coughs> than the size of the query itself. So you get it sort of an infinite loop. So, for example, you, let's say you had an element query that said, at min width 200 pixels, make my element 210 pixels. That would make an infinite loop there. And so they made this container queries. C container queries limit you to only modify the children inside of the element that you have your query scope to. So here's a very simple example of this. Um, and it's kind of the holy grail of reusable responsive components, right? Because you can make components that adapt to the width uh, of their container. So for example, here's a component that uses a vertical layout when it's uh, smaller width available to itself, and a horizontal layout when it's wider. So here's a very simple responsive layout that, that I've worked on so many, so many times at Filament Group. Uh, this is the small layout. We just have three simple uh, blocks of content. When you resize it, you switch to a double column, right? Two columns. Then when you resize a little bit more, you add a rail and switch back to a single column. Make it a little bit wider, you want a two column again, hooray, but you still have the rail. And the big problem with media queries is that they're globals, right? The things that are in blue here, the media queries that are in blue, apply only because the rail has been added. Um, so if we have a media query that we're building these green reusable components with, it needs to know 
the global layout and the containers that, ex that uh, apply to it. It needs to know where it exists. And we want the components to be modular, right? We, won't, we don't want them to have to know where they live. So here's what a container query might look like. We say our grid component has a min width of 30. We can get rid of those uh, media queries that are scoped to use those, that, that filter bar on the right, the blue filter bar. And we can just say, hey, when this grid has at least 30 M's, is at least 30 M's wide, obey these rules. Switch to the two columns. And it will do all that for us behind the scenes. So container queries really simplify your style guide boilerplate too, right? Because even if you have a component that only exists once, it only exists in one place in your design or in your application, you still want it to exist in your documentation, right? You don't want to have to add all the layers of parent containers inside your documentation when you have it uh, documented. We just want it to be a simple modular thing that we can show on a documentation page. But they're really only half the battle. I really love this slide by Josh Clark. He says that content is like water. I think it's originally a Bruce Lee quote, but he stole it. Um, you put water into a cup, it becomes a cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes a bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes a teapot. I don't actually advocate putting water on your screens and your mobile devices, but the point still stands. But you wouldn't put beer in a wine glass, right? You wouldn't put Sunny D in a gas can. You wouldn't put box wine in a Coke can, right? <laughs> The content is the other half of the battle. Because breakpoints are content dependent. So for example, I don't know, we have this menu component here. And when you go to a wider screen, it switches and adds a little menu text here. And when you go even wider, it gets rid of the menu altogether and shows the items, the menu items in line. And we do that at the 50M breakpoint. <laughs> but that's dependent on how many elements we have in the menu, right? So when we add another element to our menu, we have to go back and change in two separate places. We have to change our markup and we have to change our style sheets. Very brittle. Very tightly coupled. Um, so here's another bootstrap example. If you're going to tweet out this, you can use the hashtag, I love bootstrap. They switch from a nice hamburger menu icon here to a wider uh, item with the search bar on the right. But again, those are all content dependent. And Bootstrap actually only has five, five standard stock breakpoints that they uh, include in their uh, toolkit. They have extra small, which is 543 pixels, um, small, medium, large, and extra large. And they expose classes that you can use to put those in your markup to customize when content is shown and when it's hidden. So for example, if you want your, as I mentioned before, Bootstrap kind of has a 12 column grid. So if you want your uh, element to take up a third of the space on this extra small breakpoint, you use this extra small dash four, and so on. And you can also hide it and show things with these uh, supplementary classes as well. But what happens when you need a breakpoint that's in the middle? Right, we want fluid, we don't want so there's, there's kind of two camps when it comes to responsive applications. People that think that things are responsive, but they aren't actually responsive, we call those twerky layouts. And you can see those when you resize it, because the layout kind of goes instead of being completely fluid. And that's what Bootstrap is kind of advocating here, because they really only give you not very granular, anti-granular uh, breakpoints. So let's say we, have our, we, we need a 40M breakpoint. What do we do? We have to add that in CSS. Say we need to add even more features to our navigation bar. Some more menu items into our navigation bar. That's a problem, right? So you end up, when you have these bootstrap applications, you end up adding your own separate classes if you go along with their sort of uh, class abstraction for media queries. So you might add an extra small, small dash four. You might add a medium small dash four. You might add a medium large. This is very untenable, right? Because it's a, it's a, at its core, it's a leaky abstraction. And you can actually combine these, right? So you can have uh, an element that takes up 
a fourth of the screen an extra small, and half the screen at small, and um, two thirds of the screen, or three fourths of the screen at medium, and the full width at large. Actually, you'd probably do it reverse, but you know what I mean. But this is a very, very leaky abstraction, right? It's a huge problem. Our responsive grids all over the place have this problem. So here's an example of one called skeleton grid. At 549 pixels, single column. At 550 pixels, one pixel different, it switches to grids. And so, because they also use a 12 column grid, you could have 12 individual columns of content there. It, doesn't, it just doesn't make, that arbitrary breakpoint doesn't make any sense. Here's one called Bourbon Neat. They switch at 800 pixels. 799 single column, 800 grids. Here's another one, I don't think I put the name of this one on here. <laughs> but again, 767, single column, 768, full grids, amazing. I tweeted this today, this layout is single column at 767, but well, add one pixel, and you have a 12 column layout, it's amazing. It makes no sense, right? These reusable components, if you want to make a reusable component, you can't have hard-coded breakpoints built in. Because not only will your breakpoints change, but your breakpoints aren't going to be my breakpoints. So how do we minimize the impact of those changes? We need to manage our breakpoints in one place, right? We don't want to manage our breakpoints inside of the HTML. I know why, I mean, it's obvious to see why uh, Bootstrap exposes these classes so people don't have to touch the CSS. But it's a CSS component framework. People shouldn't be afraid of using CSS. Don't jump into this abstraction because you don't want to write some media queries. So how do we maximize component reusability? As I said before, your breakpoints are probably not my breakpoints. And my breakpoints probably aren't my breakpoints across the same project. Because it's all content dependent, right? So really the only thing we can do is when you're exposing, when you have an open source project that publishes reusable code, or you want to use your code in multiple places in your project, you have to reduce the number of media queries. So we end up relying on the first two elements of responsive web design, and try and minimize the third one as much as possible. The other thing you can do is cry. <laughs> I do that a lot. Until we get container queries, and then we'll, we can stop crying. But we don't have them yet. Well, uh, another thing that we've had good sec success with is um, we expose our breakpoint co code as a preprocessor mixin. So we have this uh, at Filmon Group. We have a component called Table Saw. It's responsive tables plugin, and we have a stack table. So stack table is part of it. So when you resize the stack table to a small viewport, uh, it puts the table headers on the left and the table data on the right. And the stock CSS breaks at 40 M's, which works great for this sample table, but are you going to use the sample table in your application? How many people are making a movie title uh, <laughs> application? Not many. Right, yeah, it's content dependent. So we actually expose this as a SAS mixin as well. So if you want the table saw stack table, you can include this uh, mixin inside of a selector, and it will allow you to customize that breakpoint to whatever you want. And probably most controversially, we try to reuse the amount of CSS we put in reusable code. Right? It's such a weird thing to say. Not only my anti JavaScript, here I am anti CSS too. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I don't mean all your CSS. I mean, if you have structural CSS that serves a functional purpose, that's good. But if it's just display CSS, try to leave it off if possible. And so, I shit you not, this is our tab component. If you go into uh, Film a Group repo and look at our tab example, this is what it looks like. Not very impressive, right? But we use this everywhere. No CSS here. Not, there's no CSS in this reusable component. 
Look at how resizable it is. <laughs> See that? That's amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Here's our accord accordion. <coughs> it doesn't have any CSS either. The reason those are bold? Because they're header elements. That's default browser style. So if you have zero CSS, guess how many breakpoints this has? None. Uh, here's our menu component. Pretty awesome, right? Amazing. <laughs> and yes, it works out of the box with touch, click, keyboard, whatever. Doesn't need any CSS to do that. We also have a plugin that we call uh, Select Proxy. So this one's kind of complicated, but it's just a menu that lets us put more complicated CSS inside of the menu. But the stock component does not include any CSS. So we have a progressive disclosure component. You check a checkbox, it shows more form elements. Very simple. And so we have all of these components, and they're all kind of based on one single parent component. The collapsible, oh, the, yeah, it's so exciting. <laughs> it's not a very exciting component, but it's the workhorse of our responsive work at Filament Group. We use it all over the place. Here's the markup for it. Very simple. It's a parent container, a header, and content. And this one actually does have some CSS. It's the only, only one that has CSS. When the component is enhanced, which is a class that we add in JavaScript uh, when the JavaScript runs, <clears throat> we hide the content when it's collapsed. And that's really it. That's, that's, the, that's all of the CSS that we expose for all of those five or six components in a reusable fashion. So pretty, pretty simple, right? But we get a ton of reusability out of this. It's progressively enhanced. It has built-in accessibility. It adds our uh, ARIA attributes for us automatically in JavaScript. It's input, input agnostic. It works with touch, mouse, stylus, keyboard, uh, weird Google Glass eye pointers, whatever you want to use. Um, and it's only, I said 2 kilobyte, but it's 2.49 kilobyte. So, you know, round down, whatever. <laughs> and this is what it looks like. That's what it looks like with JavaScript. And here's what it looks like without JavaScript. It's the same. All right. Without JavaScript, if you click on the header, obviously it won't do anything. Here's how we've used it inside our applications. I've taken these uh, GIFs from client work, so I've tried to anonymize as much of the content as possible. So if you are able to guess what client we've used, please don't tweet it. I might get in trouble. <clears throat> So, yeah, pretty simple, simple, collapsible. Here's what uh, one of our accordions looks like. And it has lovely animations. Um, here's some form disclosure controls. If you have a PO box, we show additional um, instructions that you can only ship with ground. This was on a checkout page. If you have an apartment or suite, those are two separate collapsibles. Um, it adds additional uh, form element to, uh, for the second line of the address. Keeps things cleaner. And here's what the select looks like. I think this one's kind of cool. So it kind of lets us put arbitrary HTML inside of a, a menu, but it proxies to a form select behind the scenes. So this is kind of what happens behind the scenes. When you select something, it changes the, uh, the form element value. But obviously this menu isn't going to be a successful form control. The great thing about this 
is that the, uh, the fancy menu, we hide using already hidden true. So to a screen reader, it just looks like this. Without JavaScript, it just looks like this. Very simple. Oh, this one's a breakpoint example. So, when you have wider screens, they're not collapsibles at all. And this is all content dependent, right? We wanted three columns at a certain breakpoint. And we were able to do that very easily because there were no breakpoints in our uh, root collapsible. But those are all collapsible components, three collapsible components. Bligo.com. I obfuscated that really good. <laughs> Shop the Bligo store. Yeah. Uh, here's another example of a uh, breakpoint version, I think. It was uh, kind of an accordion style layout of the small screen. And the bigger screen switches to tabs. Very, very, very simple. Here's another one that I obfuscated very well. <laughs> <laughs> the red parts are things that you're not supposed to see. Um, <laughs> but this is probably the most impressive uh, example of the collapsible, right? Because these are all collapsibles. Um, it's a slide out menu, so this is actually two different screenshots side by side. So at the small screen, we have this uh, slide out panel that comes out and shows the, the menu, and then we have collapsibles inside of it. But then at larger screens, it turns into hover menus, uh, which contain all the subcategories for bligo.com. <laughs> and that's kind of it. I mean, the point that I'm trying to come across with today is that we've gotten a lot of success out of minimizing the amount of CSS that we have in our reusable components. Um, Yes, that means we end up writing CSS per project. Um, but think about all the different UI frameworks that have come and gone over the years. I've been making websites for 19 years, <laughs> a long time. And so the first website I made predated any reusable components. Um, I think the first component library I used was YUI, Yahoo's user interface library. That one I don't think exists anymore. If it does, no one's maintaining it. Um, so these things come and go, and when they do come and go, you've got to throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? You've got to throw out the JavaScript that was uh, perfect for your needs because uh, the, the library is antiquated, because it looks antiquated. CSS comes and goes much quicker than your behavior. Um, so if you want to refresh your component library, it's easier to do that with the CSS upgrade than it is to rewrite the whole thing from scratch. So that's it for me. You guys have any questions? So when you actually apply those shared components in one of your client applications, you still use media queries to set those breakpoints, right? Yes. So all of our open source code, um, we expose as NPM packages, and then we import those in the package JSON, and then it's good. Uh, included into the individual pro uh, the individual client projects, and so we s we obviously write media queries, but at the end, uh, it's not part of the reusable code uh, okay. as much as possible. But the end product then still has all the same problems with knowing where to set the breakpoints and the one pixel difference, like all those things you complained about are still there, right? Well, so the breakpoints that we use in our client projects are tailored to the project. Oh, okay. So that was your point, is that you want to tailor it to the specific project instead of doing it at the shared component level. Yes. Okay. Cool. <laughs> if that wasn't clear, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs>